Our reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verse 25. Let us hear the words of the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, As you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph... And Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, it's almost hard to believe, but Christmas is almost here. We're only four weeks away. And there's no denying it because everywhere we go, there are the sights and the sounds of the season already beginning to emerge around us. There's lights and decorations. There's Christmas trees and Christmas music. There's ads on the TV. There's the Salvation Army bell that's ringing at every store that we go to. You know, so many times this four weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas seem like such a blur, don't they? They seem like they just go so incredibly fast, and it it all builds up to this one day on Christmas, and and by the time we get there, we're run down, we're exhausted, we're drained, we're worn out, and another Christmas comes, and another Christmas goes, and and what we end up experiencing is anything but a, a Christmas beyond imagination, that many times what we experience is a letdown, right? You know, we get there, there's been all this build up, and we get there, and now there's the decorations to put up. And there's the, the, you know, the packages that have been opened and played with for a couple hours, and then they're forgotten. Right? We, we get there, and it's almost like everything has been building, but now it didn't quite live up to all the hype and all the expectations and all the hopes and the dreams that we had for this particular day. Uh, Chuck Swindoll put it like this in his rewriting of the classic Christmas poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas. He said, Twas the day after Christmas, when all through the place there were arguments and depression, and even mom had a long face. The stockings hung empty, and the house was a mess. The new clothes didn't fit, and dad was under stress. The family was irritable, and the children no one could please because the instructions for the new swing set were written in Chinese. (laughs) The bells no longer jingled, and no carolers came around. The sink was stacked with dishes, and the tree was turning brown. 
The stores were full of people returning things that had fizzled and failed, and the shoppers were discouraged because everything they'd bought was now on half price sale. It was the day after Christmas. The spirit of joy had disappeared. The only hope was 12 bowl games on the first day of the new year. Now, I remember one particular Christmas. We had gathered together for my extended family Christmas. And so my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my cousins, we were all there. And we were going around the room and, and opening up our gifts. And I got to grandma's gifts. Now, grandma's gift was always interesting to begin with. You never quite knew what you were going to get from her. A lot of times it was pickles and relish that we had to swap because she never could remember who wanted which one uh, of the two things. But this year we were in for a treat. We all opened up our gifts and I turned to this package. I opened it up and I just stared at it. I didn't know quite what to expect, uh, but this was interesting. I didn't know what to say. And then my aunt, who was sitting next to me, kind of voiced the thoughts of everyone in the room. A pine cone? You got them a pine cone? You know, sometimes we come to Christmas morning, and what we experience is a bit like that pine cone. It's nothing all that spectacular. It's nothing all that special. It's common. It's ordinary. It's routine. It's mundane. And somehow, this pivotal moment in our faith has lost the ability to truly inspire us. To leave us in awe and wonder and excitement. I mean, we've heard these stories so many times before that that, that we know exactly what's going to take place. We know how the story is going to unfold. And and, and it's become so familiar that, that sometimes that familiarity means it no longer inspires us the same way that it used to. Yet as I read these stories in, at the beginnings of the Gospel of Luke, I, I'm struck by the joy that is found in these stories. The, the sense of wonder, the sense of awe, the sense of excitement that every single character that we encounter in these first two chapters of Luke are experiencing. I mean, the moment that Mary shows up at the home of Zachariah and Elizabeth, we're told that the, the baby in her womb leaps for joy. At the presence of Jesus. And Mary erupts in this song of praise as she cries out that my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And she begins to cry out of uh, of this incredible message of great joy. And we see it with Zechariah when when his mouth is finally opened up after the birth of John the Baptist. And he cries out and praises God because God has sent his fulfillment time Messiah into the world. When Jesus is born, we hear the angels on Christmas ears cry out with a a message of good news, of great joy. But we hear it from the shepherds and they, they go to the manger and they get there and they go away praising God and declaring a message of joy to everyone that they meet. And then we get to Simeon and Anna in our text for today. And and these two people who, who, as soon as they encounter Jesus in the temple when he's just eight days old, and they're crying out and praising God for the incredible things that God is doing. Simeon is so moved that he bursts out and says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. You see, every single character in this story is filled with a message of joy, something they they can't contain, a song that they have to cry out because they are so in wonder that they have the privilege of being part of what God is doing in the world. And we too are incredibly privileged to be a part of this story of Jesus. Because God has sent him into this world that we might have new life and new salvation. And that is something that is worth standing in awe over. Because this was not something we deserved. 
But this is something that God chose to do for us by his grace. You see, what what we experience, what, what every character in this story is experiencing is something that is far from common. That is far from being mundane. What they are truly experiencing is a Christmas beyond imagination. Because after 400 years of silence from God, God is finally doing something again. God is suddenly moving into their worlds in ways that they couldn't have fathomed, that they couldn't have dreamed or expected. And so my hope and my prayer for us throughout this Advent season is that we too might encounter a Christmas beyond imagination. That it wouldn't just be the same Christmas that we get to experience every single year, but there would be something different about this. That we would encounter Jesus Christ anew. And, and, and that we would encounter him fresh this year. Yeah, I find it so remarkable that these characters are, are so overwhelmed with joy because I mean, if we step back and think about it, there were really only a few people that even encountered Jesus on this Christmas, right? It was Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men. You know, we know the stories, right? It was just a few people who were even there at the manger. That for most people, it was just another day that they, they missed, You see, most people had given up hope. They had been waiting and waiting and waiting for years, for decades, for centuries. And they had given up hope because they had been waiting for so long. And we can sympathize, right? I mean... We don't like to wait, right? Do you, do you like to wait? I mean, we don't like to wait on traffic. We don't like to wait at the stoplights. We don't like to wait at the airport. We don't like to wait on the phone. We, we, we don't like to wait at the doctor's office. And we don't like to wait on God to move either, if we're really honest. But yet Luke highlights these These two people, Simeon and Anna, these two people that we never hear of again in the entire story of the Bible, simply because they are still waiting. They're still waiting. They're still waiting on God to come. They're still waiting for their Messiah. I mean, Simeon is said to be a righteous and devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. Anna is said to to never leave the temple. She is there night and day, worshiping and praying and fasting before God. Day after day after day, they are waiting and waiting and waiting, actively waiting, seeking God's face. I mean, they're doing this for almost their entire life. I mean, do you hear this? I mean, Anna is said to be 84 years old. Or, or, or the Greek is actually a little more complicated. It could mean that she was married and it's been 84 years since she was married. Which means she could be 103, 104 years old. Simeon, according to tradition, 112. So, so these are two people who have been waiting for most of their life for the promises of God. And yet they refused to give up hope. They kept Seeking the face of God day after day after day. And now that wait is finally over. I want to ask you today, what would you be willing to wait your entire life for? What would you be willing to wait your entire life for? I'm reminded of a story. It's a story about a nine-year-old girl. And her name was Jill. And Jill wanted a hamster more than anything else. Her her mom had told her she could have a hamster, but she was going to have to wait till Christmas to get it. And so she decided uh, that she would start over the next three months writing a few simple words in her diary every day. And so she got it out. She wrote down 87 days until I get my hamster. 
86 days until I get my hamster. 85 days until I get my hamster. 76 days. 32 days. She, she counted down and down and down. And each day as she was counting, her excitement grew and grew and grew. You see, that's Simeon and Anna. The more they pray, the more they seek God's face, the more their excitement grows. I mean, see, here's the lesson. That the Christmas that we experience is determined by our approach. You see, the way that we wait, the way that we hope, the way that we prepare our hearts to encounter Jesus Christ is ultimately going to determine the type of Christmas that we can experience. Whether it ends up being just another day or if it becomes something truly special and meaningful. What matters is our approach. And so if we want a different kind of Christmas than what we typically got, then we're going to have to do things differently than we've done them before. We have to approach it differently. We have to, to begin to implement some new practices in our life to encounter Jesus differently than we've done in the past if we really want a Christmas beyond imagination. And so the question is, how are we actively waiting on Jesus to come? How are we actively preparing for his arrival? I mean, I think Simeon and Anna can teach us a few things because they waited really well. And I think the first thing that they teach us is that we need to wait upon God by dwelling in his presence. Truly dwelling in his presence. Not just popping in for a moment or two or for an hour on Sunday morning, but dwelling in his presence. When you dwell in something, you live there. You find your life there. You find your existence there. You hang out there. You saturate your life in it. Right? You marinate in it. I mean, the Bible says that Anna never, never left the temple. That she was there night and day. That there was no moment of her life that she was not dwelling in the presence of God. The, the Greek language implies that she's stationed there at a post like a watchman on the wall. That she is waiting for that moment to arrive. That she's eagerly anticipating it. And she's defined by doing this through worship, through prayer, and through fasting. And so I, I wonder, what, what's the nature of your worship life? Not just on Sunday morning, but the rest of the week. Or what's the nature of your, of your prayer life? Are, are you actively dwelling in the presence of God? Are you dwelling in his words? Are you dwelling in, 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 in just sitting in the very place that he is? Or do you just pop in for a moment or two and then move on to the rest of your day or whatever else you got going on in your plate? Do you, do you truly dwell in his presence? Where you can pray without ceasing, where you can worship without ceasing, that where you're, there's not a single moment of your life that goes by outside of the awareness that God is here. I wonder when was the last time that you fasted and actually gave something up to encounter the presence of Jesus Christ in your life? I want to challenge you throughout this Advent season, this season of waiting, to, to make it a priority to be in church every single week. And to take time every single day of the week to dwell in the stories surrounding Jesus' birth. To just dwell there, to sit there, to, to let them resonate for a while. I, I, I just put out a new reading plan this week, and uh, it's just a couple verses each day. And, and it's, the, the temptation is to, to read through them in 30 seconds and be done. But what I want to challenge you to do is to read them and reread them and read them again. You know, allow them to, to, to saturate the pores of your life and to, to allow this story to truly become who you are. To allow that story to read you and, and to challenge you to, to begin to maybe do things a little differently. Maybe take moments 
to stop throughout the week and, and, and to spend some extra time in prayer and worship and singing Christmas carols. You know, maybe take, take a retreat day. Maybe build some new practices into your life. Maybe set up an Advent candle in your home. Uh, one thing that uh, we're doing here in the church, um, in your bulletins, if I can find the thing, uh, there's a candle in there. And this is something that Kathy had introduced to her kids and wanted us to, to do it together. And there'll be a candle in there each day of the, uh, of the month of Advent. And we, we want you to take a moment just to pause and to reflect on the gifts that God is giving us this season, right? This week's the, the gift of hope. Okay, so where have you encountered hope? Or where have you seen hope in your life? What, what is maybe some time that you've needed the hope of God? And just to take a moment to, to write those things down on the candle, maybe, or around it, you know, however the, you have the space to do it, on the back if you need it, to, to take some time just to, to reflect and to write those things down. And when you come up later for communion, to drop them here in this plate is just a, an offering back to the Lord to say, God, I'm hoping in you. I'm actively waiting for you to come this year. What, what are some new things that we can begin to do to ready our hearts to encounter him differently than we have in the past? And secondly, we wait upon God by listening to his voice. Yeah, I find it so interesting because both Simeon and Anna have a real sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's not explicitly said, but, but Simeon knows that he's not going to die until he encounters the Messiah. Like the Spirit has told him that at some point in his life, and he's had the wisdom enough to, to believe this. Right? To, to, he, he knows that God has spoken to him. And, and, and when Jesus walks into the temple that day as this eight-year-old baby, both of them have the awareness, the, the discernment from the Holy Spirit. They've been listening to their voice enough to know that this is that child. Right? This is the one that they've been seeking. That This is the one they've been waiting for. Even though he looked nothing like what they would have expected a Messiah to be. I mean, most people wanted a conquering hero. But here you have a helpless eight-year-old baby. This is not the way they expected their Messiah to come. But yet they still have the awareness to realize that this is the child. That this is the fulfillment of their promise. Because they've been listening to the voice of of the Spirit. In fact, the Bible tells us that Simeon is moved by the Spirit to go into the temple that day. That he's been listening to the voice of the Spirit. I wonder how might we take a moment to just pause and to listen to his voice, to familiarize ourselves with his voice in this season whether that's through the words of God or through prayer or simply by taking stop, the time just to stop and to be quiet in his presence. I mean, there's so much noise this time of year. <laughs> but if we want to encounter Jesus, we need to learn to silence the noise. I mean, there was probably a lot of noise that day too. Right? They're, they're in the temple. The temple was a busy place. There's sacrifices. There's animals. There's people talking. There's money changers in the temple. There's all this noise going on. And yet they still are quiet enough that they know that this is the one. They can hear the voice of the Spirit. How might we still ourselves in the midst of the noise of this season to hear Jesus and to hear his voice? And the Bible tells us that he's not in the earthquake, he's not in the big powerful moves, that he is in the still, small voice. He's in the quiet space. And so if we want to encounter him, we sometimes have to stop and be still and simply know that he's God. 
We wait by listening. Thirdly, we wait through regular, daily, faithful obedience. I mean, a lot of times when we think about obedience, we think about, should I do this or should I do that? Right? What's God's will for my life? This one big moment that I need to follow him in doing this specific thing. But the truth is that, that obedience most of the time in Scripture is simply being faithful in the little things. It's simply being faithful in all the things that we've known, right? Simeon is righteous and devout because he's simply doing all the things that he's learned since the time he was a boy. Zechariah, and we talk about next week, is also said to be righteous and devout simply because he's been doing all the things that he's been learning as a, since the time he was a boy. What are the little things, those little ways that we can simply step out in obedient faith this season to encounter Jesus Christ? I wonder how might he be calling you to simply be faithful in the places that you already are? At your home, at your workplace, at school, at the store, in the dentist chair, and wherever you might find yourself to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that place. And then finally, we wait by seeking the fulfillment of his promises. I mean, that's really what Simeon and Anna had been doing their entire life, seeking the fulfillment of the promise of God. You know, we too are waiting for the promise of God because Jesus has said he'll return. He said that he will come back. You see, Christmas and Advent aren't just to remind us of what he did. They're to remind us of what he will do. They're to remind us of the promise that's still to come. And every year, you know, kids wait in anticipation for Christmas like nothing else, right? They get antsy. Right, they start writing letters to Santa. They get excited. They wake us up at the crack of dawn on Christmas morning because they can't wait to get out of their packages. But I wonder what would happen if that day never came? What would happen if it was like in the Narnia books where it was always winter and never Christmas? What would happen to their enthusiasm, to their excitement? And I think this is what has happened many times that we've been waiting so long that we no longer think it's going to happen in our lifetime. And we give up hope. But you see, they had been waiting just as long. And yet they kept pressing into the promise. I wonder what would happen, what, what we would experience if we would press into Jesus and to, that we would seek the fulfillment of his promises as if it was going to happen in our life. I wonder how it would change the Christmas that we experience if we truly pressed in with expectation and with hope and excitement and joy and awe and wonder about what he's about to do. How might he be calling you to wait for him this Advent season? Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you today. And we come with a, an expectant hope. Not just about what you have done but about what you are doing and what about what you will do in the future, Lord. We ask that you would show yourself, that you would make yourself real, that we would cling to the promises of God in our life, that we would dwell in your presence and listen to your voice and step out in obedient hope. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.